One of the um, interesting things about HPV negative head and neck cancer is that the genomic profile has been um, driven by mutations in tumor suppressor genes. And this has made these cancers somewhat um, difficult to approach with um, targeted therapy. Um, but it may actually indicate that they have increased suitability for immune checkpoint inhibition. Working together with my colleagues at Fox Chase Cancer Center and at Keras Biosciences, we undertook an analysis of over 1,000 HPV-negative head and neck cancers, which had undergone um, genome profile filing at Keras. They have a panel that includes 592 genes. And in addition to being able to look at some of the main tumor suppressors that are commonly mutated in head and neck cancer, this is a large enough gene panel that it can give, give you an accurate assessment of tumor mutation burden. So uh, we analyzed the uh, cohort looking for those patients with p53 mutation, those patients who had CDK N2A um, mutation um, or amplification, and then uh, looked at what was the, the uh, prevalence of these mutations and the uh, likelihood of higher tumor mutational burden by uh, gender and subsite. And um, one of the challenges with an approach like this is which mutations in P53 are you going to call as significant? With a large gene, you can have um, mutations that are truncation uh, mutations. You can have gain-of-function mutations in about 20% of cases. Um, there are uh, various algorithms for ca calling which mutations in the DNA binding domain might, be, uh, might lead to disruption. And so we actually uh, compared a number of um, algorithms for calling uh, P53 mutations. We started with the one that Keras Biosciences uses for their um, routine reports. Um, we looked at the Poeta algorithm, which had, had been developed by investigators in ECOG, as well as um, the two IARC classifications, and we also called out those patients who had gain-of-function mutations. So um, the first thing that was um, pretty interesting was that the um, number of patients who were called P53 uh, mutated, obviously um, varied by which one of these uh, classifications uh, you used, um, and um, particularly the um, difference between the, the Keras uh, readout and the, the more functional readouts was, was pretty striking. Um, but the other thing that we wanted to look at then was um, what was the uh, prevalence of tumor mutation burden, and we defined this as um, uh, above uh, 15 per megabase. And what we found was that the um, coexistence of mutation in P53 and CDK N2A was particularly predictive of high tumor mutation burden, as long as this was not a gain of function mutation in P53. So uh, gain of function mutations, this was a, a smaller um, number of cases and we didn't have the same statistical power. So um, I, I think that's more of an exploratory finding. It appeared as if gain-of-function mutations in P53 were not as significant drivers of tumor mutation burden, but it was particularly when you had CDK and 2A and P53 disruptive mutations together that uh, tumor mutation burden was, was driven into the higher range. And I think that um, as we learn more about how to select patients for immune checkpoint inhibition and who among the patients who's going to get a PD-1 inhibitor should also get chemotherapy, um, having information that, that helps us predict who's going to be in the higher tumor mutation burden uh, groups uh, may also be very instructive.